Hello and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining me today on this week's Ask the Gardener here on the Irish Gardener. Loads of questions have come in already during the week. I'll be chatting with Colin Power soon up in his organic garden in Kildare. Uh, we'll be looking at our rather Coleman will be showing us how he's managing to to keep um, the cabbage white butterfly off his veg. Uh, next week, you'll be interested to know. I'll be joined by a Japanese knotweed expert. I'm getting lots of questions about Japanese knotweed and how to control it. So we'll be joined by Kieran next week on that. As I say, soon it'll be Coleman. I just want to go quickly into some of the questions which have come in first already during the week. So I'm just going to quickly go to them. And there's Catherine Gallagher. I've just discovered ground elder in a flower bed. Some of it is right under plants like spirea what can i do please well there's a picture of the the ground elder and it's i'm afraid it's a curse of a weed uh, i know when coleman's on later he'll probably be telling us all to eat it because i i know a lot of people do eat the very young shoots of it it's, it's lovely as a, uh, as a as a salad leaf and there's a picture of it in flower later by which point i'm told it's gone too bitter to eat uh, and too tough but regardless of whether you choose to eat it or not it's a difficult one to get rid of i'm afraid and it's not um it's not one that i have a, a magic wand for so if you've just discovered a bit of it the ground or the best thing to do is get out there with a hand trowel or a shovel and just dig it out but get roots and all get every bit of it very often it can come in with the plant it may have come in in the roots of a garden center plant or a plant you got from a friend uh but really it is hand weeding if it's if it's um if it's rampant in the garden and lots lots of gardens do have it rampant uh it's just a question of learning to live with it i'm afraid outgrowing it out competing it uh i'm not going to recommend that you use a chemical weed killer because they don't like using them in the garden but even if you did they're ineffective against ground elder so it's pointless um it's a question of living with it if it's if it's rampant but if in this case and hopefully it's only a small area of it get out there and, and dig it out in the first instance and you should be successful Catherine Carberry wrote in during the week. It's here. Uh, hi, I have a camellia and the leaves have started to shrivel and go brown. Uh, it has finished flowering. Thanks. That's from Catherine. Catherine, a bit more information, just if you could, if you're watching now today, just even if you could get into the comments. So if it's a new camellia, if it's brand new and it's still in the pot, or even if it's just been planted in the last couple of months, uh, it's more than likely lack of water. It's more than likely drought. If it's an established plant and the leaves are going brown and shriveling, well, then I would say to you, Catherine, it could be several things, most likely fungal. So if it's a fungal infection, uh, which is causing that, always the go-to tool there in the first instance is what we call cultural control. And what I mean by that is allowing good air circulation through the plant so that it's less prone to fungal problems. Uh, so pruning off any infected growth, a bit like we do as ourselves, as humans, you know, if you get an infection in, in a cut, you try and remove as much of the infection as possible. It's the same here with the camellia. If it's got a fungal blight, remove as much of it by pruning, treat it, uh, and you could use something like copper sulfate. Now, copper sulfate is okay to use, but be careful, like just use it once a year. So I was not it's something that you'd use willy nilly or every week or anything like it. Use it about once a year. But so you, you remove the infection, you treat the infection, and then you build up the immunity of the plant. Use something like the, the nature safe liquid seaweed feed, any good seaweed feed to, to boost the immunity of the plant and to stop it getting the infection in the first place. Could be sooty mold as well, which is more black. Same treatment as I just said for fungal, because it's another fungal infection. Um, but as I say, and it sounds from the likes of your question, from the tone of your question, it might be a brand new plant that finished flowering this year and has just, the leaves have just gone brown, in which case it's it's just simple uh, as blight or as drought, I'm afraid. Hopefully that answers you, Catherine. Bernice has sent in, hi, this year I have developed a sensitivity, sorry, I'm not, not laughing, Bernice, of course I'm not, uh, a sensitivity to gardening where I get itchy. It's very annoying. Any suggestions? The, I don't have a suggestion as an answer, Bernice, but the, the only suggestion I would make in the first instance is to try and identify what's causing it. It's not, you, you haven't developed the sensitivity to gardening full stop. It's something in the garden. It's a particular plant, most likely. Uh, it could be something in the soil. It, it, I don't know, obviously, what it is, um, but you do need to identify what it is. There are a lot of plants, obviously, which will do it. Some of the common ones are things like Fremontodendron, Aconitum, euphorbia, there are loads of, of common plants that will give you this sensitivity, but you need to identify which one it is first. I don't I don't think it's it's to gardening in general. 
Uh, I hope it's not anyway, Bernice. Do let us know how you get on, please. Lorraine's here. Hi, we planted we planted a new laurel hedge this year and want to know when we can trim it. Thanks. That's from Lorraine Marr. Lorraine, um, you can't trim any hedge anyway, and you were otherwise until September under the Wildlife Protection Act. You're not allowed to cut your hedges between March and September. Unfortunately, this is for another day, but unfortunately, there are two exemptions to that local authorities and farmers, the two largest owners of hedgerows in the country. Uh, so you're not, we're not allowed to, 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 to cut it back now. But anyway, horticulturally, you're better off cutting it back either, I would say, before the end of February or the other end of the year after September. So it's actually, it ties in with the, the, the Wildlife Act. So I would say late late September, mid to late September, cut it back. And when you're cutting it back, uh, again, give it a bit of a feed, give it a mulch with some organic material, compost, your own homemade compost will do fine, farmyard manure, anything like that, just to drive on growth. Uh, so that'll be late September for you, Lorraine. Uh, Catherine Gallagher is here. I've just discovered, if I can see it. I've just discovered, oh, that's Catherine. We did the ground elder one, sorry. Hi, Peter. I love your selection of bulbs. Not sure who this is from. I'm just wondering, do you ever do varieties of snowdrops? I don't. I, do you know what? I don't do snowdrops from bulbs. And I, I just to let you know, all my autumn bulbs are, are available to pre-order now for delivery in the autumn. They're the spring flowering alliums, tulips, all those ones. But I don't do snowdrops. And the reason I don't do snowdrops is because I found over the years from experience, they don't do particularly well planted as bulbs at this time of the year or in the autumn rather. Because I don't know, is it because the bulbs are so small and they dry out very quickly or what it is? But uh, to get the best results with snowdrops, you plant them what's called in the green. So in other words, during the springtime, if you have a friend, a neighbor who has snowdrops growing and they're, they're being generous, let, the, they lift, let you lift a clump out when they're still in leaf um, and plant them that way. That's the best way to grow snowdrops, not by bulbs planted in the autumn. Um, you buy them in garden centres in, in pots as well at that time of year. That's the best way to plant them. Now, before I get to the, the other questions, I see a lot of them coming in there. I want to chat with Coleman. So Coleman uh, Power is a, an organic gardener. Uh, he has a, a, a book out which we chatted about last week, and he's, he's a, a very powerful, positive force of energy. He's up in his garden now in Kildare, and I'm going to have a chat with him. Hopefully the, the, the tech won't let me down. Coleman, how are you? Peter, how are you? Good to see you. And to see you. How are things up in Kildare? We're doing very well. The rain has stayed off and uh, I suppose looking forward to anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about, I suppose, how to protect their uh, crops from the likes of the cabbage white butterfly. Yes, absolutely. Tell us more. Right, so just here, I suppose, uh, nothing like a bit of hands-on uh, visuals and I'm going to show you the likes of what I've incorporated into my uh, little bit of a garden and a veg patch here. It's the likes of a netting that's called, okay, bio netting. You can get it down the likes of Fruit Hill Farm. This is the A grade, okay? So this type of netting, you can literally make it yourself. It's a timber frame, literally with copper, not copper, with the likes of plastic piping, water piping going across the top. Just a, a dr drill a hole in either side. As a result of that, you have the likes of a structure that you literally place the netting on and either tack or staple the likes of this, uh, structure that you can use and i'm going to come a little bit closer and show you exactly what crops can go into there so the cabbage white butterfly just kind of the whole life cycle of that uh is i suppose it starts which came first the butterfly or the caterpillar it's the caterpillars which are generally laid and the butterfly lays the eggs underneath the likes of your brassica so that's your cabbages your kale and or your radishes and another one i'm going to show you is purple top milan the likes of um a beautiful turnip that you can check out here okay and i love i suppose knowing the benefits of the likes of these foods uh it's th those are the images there we can see on the screen uh, those caterpillars uh, may look nice to visually but if you ever are growing a small bit of your own you'll know the pain and the vein of you sow a seed and watered and transplanted and weeded for several weeks on end as a result of that you don't want the caterpillars doing damage to the likes of your beautiful crops. And we're going to do now, we're just going to go over here. I'm going to show you the different crops in underneath the likes of the clash that you can grow a little bit of your own. So the whole idea of myself being an organic gardener, organic grower, is for people to grow a little bit of their own. So they gain the advantage of higher magnesium. Magnesium is for energy levels. Most people are taking in a supplement. Fiber, also found in every different fruit and vegetable. So I'm just going to show you the exact colors and foods that can be grown underneath this crop. Right here. Over. It's 
straight away you can really see the bright colors is what you're looking for the darker the color the higher the antioxidants so this one right here is called purple top milan so you can also uh, get a similar variety called snowball but what i end up doing is i love getting people to add in darker colors into their diet okay so the advantage of purple in your diet a lot of people i ask them what's the first purple food item that you would have in your diet people will say blueberries and it's pretty hard to grow blueberries in Ireland very successfully but turnips and purple top milan turnip grow very very well and they're I suppose, related to broccoli and you get much more bang for your buck so in, underneath that crop i have kale as well so the kale is intercropped with this so all inside in that little maximizing the little space that you have that is two meters long and it almost most certainly is another meter wide so that's a, only a small I suppose, section of anybody's garden and that's you can produce a huge amount of food for yourself so there's three different crops underneath there so you have the kale which i can't literally pull out of the ground i don't want to go too far away from the likes of the wi-fi so we won't be able to have uh visuals here you can have the likes of your radish okay these are called breakfast two is the variety and again radishes are also related to the likes of your broccoli for those people that eat broccoli and on a regular basis it would be in the irish diet quite commonly but these are so much easier to grow and literally as i said you get much more bang for your buck and both the leaves of the purple top milan uh turnip and the likes of the red radish are both edible putting them into stir fries using them as you would spinach lightly blanching putting pink himalayan salt why because it's a natural electrolyte these are all simple things that people can do and add to their diet and grow a little bit of their own and coleman tell me that's fabulous and my god they look healthy are you sure you didn't run out of the shop and get them just then have them <laughs> hiding huh i know the well, trick. not 49 <laughs> cent feeder that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> but tell me Tell me, I take it adding something colourful to the diet, you're not going to tell me that Coca-Cola is good, no? No, no, no. I, I'm, <laughs> that's a good one. I'm actually, of all the banter that I've had about it, I've never actually had that before. Coca-Cola, I, I don't recommend Come here, just two quick questions on that, right? You said you put holes in the plastic, so you put the plastic tubing to keep the, to keep the fleece off the plants, right? Mm -hmm. And you put holes in the plastic tubing. What was that for? Uh, no, it's more sort of holes in the timber. So the two timbers are going to. Oh, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood. And the holes are for the piping to slot into. So you drill a hole, okay. and as a result of that, your water piping goes in here, and is the hoops over from one side to the other. That's as much the other. The, the other question which people might have then, uh, Coleman, is watering. How, uh, watering does water go through the fleece or go through the the screening? Yeah, in Ireland, we're uh, safe as sound. Anyway, for any crops that are growing outside, we get enough uh, water to establish uh, crops to grow very well. And there's a little point of which I suppose we can expand on. Oh, yeah. We lost you. I think I've lost Coleman. Hopefully, he, he might come back to us in a minute. Uh, yeah, we've lost Coleman for a minute. Hopefully he'll come back to us in a sec. There's another a plant, a weed rather, that I was questioned on last week and that we were talking about. And if Coleman does come back, I'm going to ask him a bit more about it as well. Because from I know from the organics point of view, it's 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 there's quite a lot of information. On it. And it's mare's tail. I put up a picture of it there. Somebody was telling me that they have mare's tail, grow, which has started into their garden and how to get rid of it. And of course, the answer is you don't, I'm afraid, get rid of it. You just really don't get rid of it because... With mare's tail, it's been with us since the time of the dinosaurs. We're not going to get rid of it now. We really do have to learn to live with it. Now, I know it's rich in silica. Uh, and I don't know if you can hear me there now or not, Colin, but if you can, I'm going to bring you back on to see if you've any experience with mare's tail in terms of it being rich in silica. Uh, and if you have anything, if if you can recommend any any use for it in terms of the diet. Did you hear that, Colin? Uh, I certainly did. I heard the question there. And uh, in relation to mare's tail, you're 100% right. Uh, weeds do come into veg patch patches, gardens or polytunnels for wherever you're growing and we do have to most certainly live with them uh, it's uh, something that the young shoots can be edible just as numerous different weeds and the definition of a weed is a plant in the wrong place and that is actually in the book that I wrote uh, it's called The Power of Organic Fitness uh, it's available on Amazon and I most certainly do uh, recommend people to add in a particular weed that inevitably people will be spraying which I highly don't recommend people to do it's the fact of dandelion dandelion is and has a high uh, 
uh, content of fiber. Fiber is good for your gut health. Gut health is linked with your immune system. Your main uh, advantage of uh, better gut health is improved mood. 90% of your serotonin. People say, cool, man, what are you currently taking? I'm literally eating more whole foods. Dandelion leaves and the dandelion root is something that you most certainly can gain the advantage of uh, making coffee. And people are going to sell it to you in a little tub. You get it in a health food shop. But I'm going to go better again. Go to your garden and literally harvest your dandelion roots that are in the garden and are you are you trying to be a politician now and evade the question i'm talking about mare's tail have you any solution for mare's tail no i i mentioned that uh, we better go back there on the recording i recommended that we have to live with <laughs> weed in our garden and most certainly it is edible i'm just talking about other weeds what's going on to there as well <laughs> <laughs> Goldman, stay on the line there. I just want to get to a few more questions, but I've no doubt someone will come up for yourself. So just bear with me there a sec. Now, um, there was a question that I had there one second ago. Just bear with me. Uh, and it's here from Mary. My pyrocanthus shrub flowers have all withered and the leaves have turned brown and are falling off. How do I treat them? Thanks, Peter. Marie Kelleher. Marie, I'd really need to see a picture of that one or a bit more information to be absolutely certain. Again, like the camellia I was talking about earlier, if it's a brand new pyrocant and it's still in the pot, then it's 99% drought. It just ran out of water. If it's a mature pyrocant that has been there for years, then that's very worrying because for a mature plant to do that that dramatically, it could be, I don't even want to use the word because it's a notifiable disease, it, it's fire blight, but I'm not saying it is, and I really don't want to alarm you. So if it's a new plant and it's only like a few months old or it's in the pot, then it's drought, I would say, you know, definitely. If it's an established plant, we, I'd really need to see a picture of it and, and get some more information before I would alarm you. There was a question coming in there that I was getting to there as well. Eilish. I wanted to plant leyland trees at the back of my garden to stop the wind and provide privacy. There's just a field behind it. What type of leyland would you suggest? It's a windy area on bog soil with good drainage, hoping for a brand, I presume you mean variety, that is better managed than the green Leyland. Um, now, I know you sent me in a picture there as well, so I'll bring that one up by leash. It's quite an exposed site, judging by the look of it. There we are. So yeah, it's quite an exposed site. Now, when you say Leyland, I'm guessing that you mean, you're using that as a kind of a general term for hedging. Uh, Lay, but Leylands themselves will will obviously, I'm not a huge fan of them, I'm not a fan of them at all, but they do what they say in the tin, if you like, and that they're a very quick growing green hedge that will break the wind. Um, if you wanted to go for a different type of hedging that isn't Leyland, obviously you have golden Leylands and variegated Leylands as well, right? But if you just wanted to go with a different type of hedging, you could go with a different type of conifer, like a, a pine or Picea or Pinus, uh, you could go for some of the Toyas, in fact, would do well in that situation. Um, but then if you wanted to go away from conifers, and as I say, if you're just using the term Leyland as a general term for hedging, you could look at things like Eliagnus. Eliagnus is my favorite of all for hedging for a windy spot. Um, trees, if it depends if you want to get trees or if you just want to lower hedge. <coughs> Excuse me, trees you could look at, as I said, things like Picea and Pinus and the conifer. But in taller trees, you could look at things like bir or Birch, yes, Beech, Alder, uh, hawthorn, any of the native trees like that that will be growing nearby will make you know you always get great tips from the landscape from the, the the area around you that kind of tells you what's going to grow and do well in your garden. Hopefully, Eilish, that um, that gives you a bit of an answer. Uh, Mary Hines is asking me, what can we plant as an evergreen flowering hedge? Thanks, sorry, Mary. The reason I'm laughing is because it's very similar to the last question. So, an evergreen flowering hedge, you could look at the one I just mentioned, which is one of my favorites. It's the Eliagnus abingii. So it's kind of a gray green leaf. Uh, lovely flowers later in the year, very important for the bees because the flowers, scented flowers, at a, a time when a lot of it else is gone, the bees love it. The Portuguese laurel, which is Prunus lusitanica, is another love. It's in flower at the moment, actually. But just be careful when you trim them that you're not trimming the flowers off. That's another nice one. You could look at something like Viburnum, Viburnum tinus. You, you know, any flowering shrub actually can be grown really as a hedge if you want to. Camellias make a lovely hedge as well, an expensive hedge, but a lovely hedge. Uh, hopefully that's a few suggestions there for you, Mary. Uh, just going to scroll back up here. I know I missed a few. Um, I have lupins. This is from Patricia Birmingham. I have lupins and there is like mildew on the leaves, it has flowered, what's best to put on them? Um, 
Again, Patricia, I'd be slow to put too much on them. It's more a question of removing the infection, this cultural control that I spoke about earlier. So allowing good air circulation around the plant, removing the infected growth, feeding the plant to, to give it that boost. The mildew, uh, it forms like any fungal infection. It forms and rust and things like that uh, in warm, damp conditions. And now obviously we have a warm, relatively warm and damp climate. So mildew loves it. So just remove a lot of the foliage so that the air can circulate better in the plant uh, and particularly remove the infected foliage. Uh, you could try a bit of copper sulfate if you wanted, uh, but just try and try and increase the overall vigor of the plant. I was down in the fabulous uh, gardens in Killarney House around this time last year. And it wasn't to do with lupins, but I think it was, I can't remember now, it may have been lupins, but it was some plant, I think it was roses and he, he uh, the, the gardener there, the head gardener, had, had mulched with their own wood chippings from the site. So they, they chipped their wood, left it for 12 months, and he had mulched around the beds with this wood chipping. And what he had found, obviously he was using it just to improve the soil texture and structure, but and also as a weed block. But what he had found, which I suppose he didn't expect, was always oh, asters. It was the asters, you know, those Michaelmas daisies, which are very prone to getting, to getting mildew. None of them got mildew the year after he put down the, the wood chippings, his own composted mm -hmm. mulch, if you like. Um, so I would look at something like that, Patricia. You know, it's all about improving the plant health by adding stuff to the soil. And I think that is your best cure for, for mildew, on, not just on lupins, but on, on nearly everything. Um, what's the flowering hedge? Geraldine, I have... Geraldine is asking, Hi, Peter. Plants in pots outside the door are being destroyed by slugs. What's the answer? Also, sunflower plant appears to be dying... Any way to revive it back? I think we overwater. Well, Geraldine, unfortunately, with the sunflower, I can answer that bit first for you. Uh, if it's and this has happened to one of my own gardens, so I can tell you, if it's if it's uh, drooping over from being overwatered, no, there isn't any way to get it back. I'm afraid, just have to say bye bye to it. I'm sorry. With uh, plants in the pots being destroyed by slugs, as you can imagine, this is the question I'm probably asked most often. Is about slugs and snails, and I'm going to go to Coleman now in a minute about this as well to get his take on it. The, the, I, I quickly go through my own few suggestions for you and one is the sheep's wool the sheep's wool is, is turned into a pellet and that makes a great barrier product so to go back a step to the start it's the most important thing for me the most important thing in the garden is to maintain the, the most important two words the natural balance right so if we can maintain this natural balance in the garden and in effect what that means is that if we ensure a wide diversity of species are, are thriving in the garden, that prevents the unnatural buildup of any single species, okay? So we interfere with the natural balance by bringing in something like the metaldehyde slug pellets because it wipes out the slugs, but it also wipes out their predators, the, the birds and the hedgehogs. The slug population will increase much more quickly than the predators. We've interfered with the balance. We need to keep buying chemicals, okay? So if we can work with the natural balance, use barrier products such as these sheep's wool pellets, we're protecting the plants and they do work I've, I've, all over my garden and where it, it degrades into as a good soil conditioner as well but these sheep's wool pellets they stop the slugs getting over they can't get over the texture of it but it leaves them available then to the predators the birds and the hedgehogs who are actually enhancing the diversity we're enhancing that balance so barrier products i think are the way to go with slugs and snails geraldine there are other barrier products like copper tape is probably the most simple one because it's in pots. You just put some sticky tape. It's like sellotape on one side and copper on the other. And what happens then is the slug, this appeals to me, whatever, whatever that says about me as a person, I'm not sure, but the slug gets a little mini electric shock as he tries to get over the copper uh, and he falls off. Again, protecting your plants, but leaving it available to the predators so that you have more birds in the garden. If you're in a rural situation, you're going to have hedgehogs and less snails. Uh, if you really need to use pellets, do and do look for things that have ferric phosphate in them as opposed to the methaldehyde. Methaldehyde pellets are, are, are banned from, for sale in many countries now across Europe, including the UK. Unfortunately, they're still available in Ireland. But the vast majority, I'm glad to say now, of slug pellets available do contain ferric phosphate. You can also use beer traps and things like that. Uh, I'm going to switch over to Coleman here because you've all heard me talk about it before. So I'm going to ask Coleman if he has any suggestions uh, in terms of, of, of uh, slug control. Coleman, I don't know, did you hear that question there from Geraldine? I certainly did, and it's a great question. Every gardener, most certainly, whether they're looking after plants and or looking after veg, have to, I suppose, deal with the likes of slugs. So I have three different I suppose, methods that I use myself and that I pass on to people. So the first of which, if you're growing the likes of, let's say, a glasshouse or a pie tunnel, 
not watering the likes of the main entrance, we'll call it the doorway, either if you have two doors or one, the point of which is slugs do not like to cross dry areas. So that is one of the first main things. You did touch on, and I love, love that point, that we need to actually work with nature. What we've done is we've used harsh chemicals, we've used these pellets for too long, and it's affecting the bio, I suppose, the whole system of nature in itself. We're trying to get back to an organic method that we most certainly are able to encourage, encourage more likes of beetles, which actually eat the slug eggs. So if you see black beetles, you're on a winner. And how we encourage, uh, I suppose, more black beetles is definitely uh, beer traps can work for the slugs, but it also can inevitably catch uh, the likes of the black beetle. So that one thing I, I will have a bit of a issue with other things that i do recommend for people are and because i eat a lot of eggs and i recommend eggs for people uh, if we, especially if you want to be more sustainable and healthier as a result of that uh, because complete proteins and healthy fats and they're low carbohydrate eggs but the eggshells are something that you can use save up crush them and put them in a circular pattern in around whatever plant or vegetable that you're trying to protect again it's like sharded i suppose um rough glass to the likes of the slug and similar to yourself it's the whole idea that there's a little bit of pleasure you can I go well now i'm protecting my plant and now I'm, I, there's no entry uh, area for the likes of the slugs likes of dry sand can also be incorporated if you have it in a dry area if it's covered or in pots again you're trying to deter the slugs and what they actually like they like damp they like wet conditions and that's another issue with watering so watering first thing in the morning and maybe even at lunchtime but not late in the evening when everything seems to be cool calm and collective and everyone's going around their flip-flops and their shorts in the summer evening because what happens the slugs come out at night and they inevitably love that so watering is such an important point such a simple thing but it's really all the simple things that add up to i suppose a successful result and i hadn't thought about or i had heard it before and as you mentioned it but i had i suppose forgotten about it the the keeping areas dry the, the, it's like again it's very basic stuff and i'm always saying this gardening isn't rocket science it is very basic it just takes time and if you keep areas dry particularly on the soil surface around the plant then you're halfway there yeah another one i had heard as well which people might be interested in i know we're spending a bit of time in this but i know everybody in ireland has a problem with slugs and snails uh is slate if you use slate as a mulch and i remember speaking to to, to what finbar o'neill from o'neill's quarries who had discovered that the slate was acting very well as a slug barrier and i thought he would going to mean the the crushed slate you know the very fine slate like you were saying with the eggshells that they couldn't get over it but actually no he had found much better results with if you can imagine using slate as a mulch but the bigger stone chips and the reason being if you could imagine you're a slug for a minute if you go down to slugs eye level and you're, you're faced with these big bits of slate and you've got hollows and mountains and hollows and mountains. And that was also working very well. So slate is a mulch. But I think the important thing is, and like you were referring to, to keep it, uh, to keep with the barrier products and try and make sure, make sure we don't actually use the pellets and the, and the, the beer to kill the slugs and other beneficial wildlife and, and to try and actually keep the slugs there for the predators, but protect the plants at the same time. Certainly save the beer. <laughs> beer, <laughs> we'll find a better use for the beer <laughs> Catherine has just sent us in a few pictures here I just want to bring them up of her peonies well done Catherine lots of people sending in pictures of their garden to me during the week great to see them some lovely peonies here from Catherine I really love the peonies the peonies of course are their roots that you plant in the in the winter and early spring and they start flowering now what you want to, to start planting now uh and as I said earlier, they're available to pre-order now on my own website, theirishgardener.com, is your tulips, alliums, daffodils, all those things. Order them now for planting out in the autumn, uh, and they'll give you colour next spring. Uh, and here's one of the, the snowdrops that we were talking about earlier, which we shouldn't, I don't really recommend planting the snowdrops from, as bulbs because uh, they tend not to do that well then. Now, Coleman, thank you very much again for, for joining me. Um, I'm trying to get the snowdrops off the screen now. Uh, you're in Cork Show this weekend, am I right? Yes, I certainly am. And I've been doing a book signing at the likes of that Cork or Summer Show. So if anybody is going to the likes of the Cork or Summer Show, I would love to meet you. If not, it's also available on Amazon. And it's a, the name of the book is The Power of Organic Fitness. It's the healthiest book in the world. If anybody knows anybody healthier, tell me about it because I would love to meet them. <laughs> well there's a challenge hey, come here thanks for joining me again next week as i said we're going to be joined by kieran who's going to be talking to me about uh japanese knotweed obviously that's uh, a huge um issue at this time of the year 
So that, that'll be next week. Coleman, hopefully you'll join me again maybe in two weeks' time. We'll chat some more about what you're doing in that fabulous garden up in Kildare, yeah? Certainly we will, and we'll keep you posted on the likes of anybody interested in a Grow Your Own course on the 2nd of July. You can give me a message on Facebook, Instagram, or any of my uh, website details are on those platforms. All right, Peter, thanks. Talk soon. Brilliant. Well, Coleman, thank you very much. Everybody else, thank you for, for watching. I hope we've been of some use to you. Thanks for the questions. As I say, do get them in in the comments uh, underneath the video, I don't just see the emails and the Facebook messages because there's, there's quite simply too many. So I'm not being rude by not answering you individually. Uh, every Friday at one o'clock, we, we do this Ask the Gardener. So if you have questions, send them in through that post and I'll do my very best to answer them. Uh, best of luck at Cork Summer Show this weekend and whatever anyone else is at. Hopefully you enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the fantastic weather that we're enjoying uh, and get to spend it in the garden. So till next Friday, thanks a million.